Hello and welcome to Democracy in the United States in the Year of Elections, an IIEA webinar. My name is Barry Colfer and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute and I want to thank you all for being with us or indeed for watching back after the fact. Discussing democracy in elections is always important, but it feels all the more urgent to do so in 2024 when more than 4 billion people are eligible to vote in elections, including in the likes of the United States, India, UK, South Africa, Mexico, and many more, including, of course, ourselves with the European and local elections forthcoming in June. I want to give a very warm welcome to our speaker, Vanessa Williamson. Vanessa is a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings and is a senior fellow at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Centre. Vanessa studies taxation, redistribution, democracy, and political participation, and is the author, along with Theda Skopkvo, of The Tea Party and the Remaking of Republican Conservatism. Vanessa is going to speak to us for about 20 minutes on this subject of democracy in the US in this year of elections, before we'll move to Q&A with you, our audience. Both the presentation and our discussions will be on the record as ever, and you can contribute to the debate using the Twitter X handle at IIEA. Without further ado, Vanessa, thank you again very much for being with us, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation. I'm so glad to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk today about democratic erosion in the United States and the upcoming 2024 election. Uh, so I think when people think about democratic erosion in the United States, uh, both here and abroad, I imagine that we think about the 2020 and 2021, when the sitting president, despite admitting privately that he had lost the election, attempted to subvert the election results and remain in office. Of course, the very uh, striking visual images of our capital being overrun by rioters, um, along with other efforts to uh, alter the vote count. And uh, you know, those should be at the forefront of our mind. It was certainly a shocking incident for American citizens. Um, but I, the point I want to make in this talk is to talk about the problems with American democracy that are beyond the problems with one candidate. Um, so although the 2022 elections, our midterm elections, occurred largely without incident, which was wonderful, uh, there is not really in the United States currently a bipartisan consensus on the rules of the game that transfer power. And so that's um, obviously a very concerning uh, sort of state of uh, state of the world uh, from a political science perspective. Um, and so I'm going to provide a little bit of background about the, the sort of longer term issues that are facing the United States. Uh, but first, I'm just going to sort of categorize the kinds of democratic erosion that are occurring here. And I should say, I'm going to focus specifically on the parts of democratic erosion that are occurring within our state institutions, right? So you can talk about the decline of media in the United States, you know, local media in the United States. There are a lot, you can talk about, uh, you know, polling data and people's affect towards the out party. There are a lot of things you can talk about in the context of democratic decline. I'm just going to talk about the institutions today in part because I think the evidence is pretty strong that, you know, the fish is rotting from the head, I'm afraid. That is to say that it is uh, political leaders who have led who, and who have sort of caused the decline, the democratic erosion that's occurring in the United States, rather than the populace having a sudden shift of opinion uh, and leaders responding to that. So, um, so the two kinds of democratic erosion that I'm going to talk about are, first of all, the strategic manipulation of elections, right? And so uh, to be clear, and this may be something that's uh, in irrelevance for, for, for a foreign audience, but in the United States, uh, there's sometimes talk about, quote, voter fraud, that's say voter impersonation, that you would in pretend to be a voter and then go vote. That basically doesn't exist. That's not a real thing. Um, but there is efforts to manipulate election procedures, and that's really significant. So, for example, there are places that have seen substantial cuts to the number of polling places there are, which makes it hard for people in certain communities to vote. Uh, there have been state level efforts to um, require certain kinds of identification that only some Americans have, making it, again, harder for certain communities to vote. Um, and then also the sort of classic maneuvers, things like gerrymandering that change the boundaries of our, of our, um, our you know, our, the uh, boundaries of representation in a way that gives one party or the other a uh, substantial advantage, right? So those are the kinds of things I mean by strategic manipulation of elections. So that's one piece that gets a lot of attention in the United States for good reason. Uh, the other piece I think is coming to the fore more now uh, as a serious issue, although and frankly it's been uh, the sort of underlying pieces of it have been in place for a long time, and it's what we call executive aggrandizement, right? And this is the idea that even a legitimately elected leader, you can win an election and still undermine democracy if what you do is while in power, 
uh, eliminate checks and balances, consolidate power uh, in among party loyalists, um, you know, and, and sort of do things that make the next election unfair. Um, so executive aggrandizement is, um, is, is, is an issue in the United States. Obviously, we have sort of three main components of our federal system. We have the executive, including the president, the legislature, Congress, and the judiciary. And um, the power of Congress has seriously diminished in recent years. The power of the executive has grown. And I'll talk a little more about this, where the judiciary lies on that. So these are the two issues, right? We've got the voting issue, we've got executive aggrandizement. But before I start talking about things that have happened in the last 10 years or so, right, where we've seen a really substantial decline in, you know, in any international measure you want to look at, um, in the quality of American democracy. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the broader context, right? Because we have a funny system here. Um, there are many longstanding aspects of uh, governance in the United States that are not particularly democratic, uh, not the way most countries that want to be a democracy set up their institutions anymore. Um, and also some things that are, that, you know, the people who founded our country would have seen as dangerous to civil liberties. Um, so in our constitution, there are two aspects that are sort of, startling, I think, for people who are, um, you know, if, if you were going to design a democracy, it might not be what you'd choose these days. One, we have a bicameral legislature where the upper house actually has quite a lot of power. Uh, so our Senate has two seats per state and our states are of very different sizes. Um, I think it's always worth remembering how, how different they are. So our largest state is California, which has 39 million people. That's where I'm from. Uh, our smallest state is Wyoming. It has 600,000. And both of those states have two seats in our Senate, which means that the people of Wyoming are represented at a rate of 66 to 1. So we also have a house that is arranged by population by you know, plus or minus a little bit. Uh, but this is a huge uh, mismatch between the population and the representatives. Uh, and the, the Senate is a powerful institution that we talk more about. Um, and the, of course, our presidential elections are also skewed to a small extent by this because we have an electoral college that takes account of the Senate uh, in terms of its numbers. Um, but the real issue with our electoral college is that our states, so our states vote for our president. And as a rule, this, the states have a winner take all system, which means that if you win the state of California by one vote, you get all of California's electoral votes, which means that there are um, there are often very large mismatches between the electoral count uh, and the actual population, you know, the voting population. Uh, and so and so, of course, sometimes that results in the candidate who didn't get the most votes winning, which we've seen a couple of times in recent years. Okay. Um, there are other two other historical aspects of American democracy that are, again, a little bit uh, at odds with how I think, you know, political scientists would recommend setting up a democracy today. Uh, one of them is the filibuster, and this exists in the Senate, and it basically allows a minority as small as one to prevent legislation from moving forward if the legislation can't get 60 votes behind it. And there's some exceptions to that rule. But uh, it, it means that the veto power of the Senate, again, this deeply... Uh, misproportioned institution is is very powerful. Uh, the other thing that is sort of a significant part of the American longstanding American practice, this both the filibuster and judicial supremacy date to the 19th century, um, is the idea that our Supreme Court uh, has the final word on whether something is constitutional. And there is not an obvious way to, um, there's not a system that exists that overrules the Supreme Court on questions of constitutionality. So as the as questions of constitutionality become really central to our discussions, the final arbiter of that is uh, an appointed a life uh, a set of people with a lifetime appointment. So not a particularly democratic system, All right? Um, so again, so we have these very longstanding historical issues uh, that uh, are are not. Are not particularly democratic, but you can't really describe as democratic erosion except on a very long time scale, right? Um, but the other thing, well, oh, I should say, and there are two things on the civil liberties front that are worth remembering. One, of course, is that we have an enormous military in this country. It is the most expensive military in the world, hands down, by a factor of several. I can't even remember at the moment. Um, and also, we have an unusually strong presidency. And I'll get back to that question when we talk about executive aggrandizement. The last thing I'll say about American democracy is we are a very old republic. We have been a republic since our founding. Uh, but we are a very new democracy by any reasonable standard, right? Because we did not have universal suffrage in this country until 1965, right? The passage of the Voting Rights Act that finally reenfranchised Black Americans in the American South, right? So um, when we think about whether we are an, an old democracy or a new one, I think you could actually argue it both ways, right? We had subnational authoritarian enclaves uh, that 
uh, you know, operated as one party states uh, for 100 years. And that only ended in the lived experience of, of many older Americans today. OK, um, I should say that in many ways, if we're talking about the democratic erosion that's occurring now, uh, it is reasonable to see that as a continuation of the backlash to the civil rights movement uh, of the 1960s. Right. Um, so you see some some of the ways in which dem democracies are voting today are replicating or echoing um, some of that earlier politics. And here I'm thinking both about the limitations on voting rights, uh, but also our the expansion of our policing and incarceration state, which in addition to obviously, you know, destroying the lives and livelihoods of people who are incarcerated, um, remove them from the civil, you know, from civil life. Uh, and so I can, in many cases, you know, felons are often disenfranchised. Uh, and so it, it actually has an effect because because mass incarceration is so high in this country, it actually does have effect on uh, who gets to vote that you know, is substantial enough to affect election outcomes. OK, um, finally, I'll just say a little bit about the international context, but I know I'm among I'm among experts on that. Uh, so once upon a time, I say 15 years ago, Ireland and the United States looked about the same on these measures. Uh, Ireland has, of course, continued to look superb on international measures of democracy, uh, while we have seen sort of a really substantial decline. Um, you know, what does that mean in practice? Uh, we, the Economist calls us um, a flawed democracy now, uh, which puts us in the same categories, places like Italy and Israel. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're just, we're just sort of a second, second tier, right? We're out of the top 10% in the varieties of democracy scale, for example. Um, so there is, it's a really substantial uh, change. Um, and I think it's something that, uh, Americans are are only just grappling with the idea that we are sort of the beacon of democracy that we would like to imagine ourselves to be. Okay, I'm going to talk for a few more minutes just about those two specific issues. So I'm going to talk about the strategic manipulation of elections, and I'm going to talk about executive aggrandizement, and then I'll wrap it up, and we can we can get to the more fun part for me, which is the questions. Right. All right. So um, elections in the United States are very heavily controlled at a state and local level. Uh, I think that is another thing that is, can be a bit startling for people from other countries. We have federal election laws. In fact, federal election law was key to the success of the civil rights movement that I mentioned earlier. But federal election law is what was the the implementation of those laws is what um, returned you know voting rights to uh, uni universal suffrage levels in the South. Uh, but an election administration happens at a state or local level, and because so much of uh, election outcomes are really about the administration, right? About who gets to vote, how easy it is for them to vote. The we have a system now where the states are diverging democratically, right? So there's international measures that we can use to look at the United States versus other countries. We also have measures within the United States um, looking at our states, and what we're seeing is there's a diversion. Some states uh, are improving their democracy. So react. Some states reacted very well in 2020 to making sure that people could still vote. Obviously, we were having an election in the middle of a pandemic. And, you know, a lot of a lot of states made enormous progress here, making vote by, by mail very easy, extending early voting and sort of coping, you know, coping with a crisis in a way that was quite impressive, frankly, as an observer. Uh, but about half of states are going in the other direction. They are making it harder to vote. They are gerrymandering more. They are um, reducing polling places they are you know they're just putting obstacles in place that systematically uh they don't legally disenfranchise people but what the systematic effect is that people do not uh get the opportunity to vote at the same at the same rate um so there's a, a wonderful political scientist named jake grumbach here in the united states who's tried to quantify this and he's created something called the state democracy index uh, which takes account of all these different factors things like polling place wait times red tape voter registration another very big issue so we have a voter registration process that in some states regularly removes people from the rolls and they wouldn't necessarily know and gerrymandering things like that um and so he so Grubach finds that some of our states are experiencing very serious democratic backsliding, and significantly, where it's happening is not places that are particularly polarized per se. It's places where there is Republican control of the state government, and this has been, uh, you know, this is a finding that's very consistent across a bunch of other things. If you look at where voter ID laws went into effect, those are places of Republican government, um, and so the dynamic is really particularly Republican governments where their control of the government would be contested or is, you know, is sort of close, this is where you're seeing these new laws going to go into place. Right. So that's strategic manipulation of elections. And I should say the Democrats are absolutely willing to uh, to engage in uh, a certain amount of the sort of gerrymandering style of election manipulation they always have. Uh, but at the moment, the sort of uh, the more extreme version of that is really coming from the Republican Party. Um, all right, executive aggrandizement. Uh, 
So this, of course, is the idea that uh, you, you're, you can have a perfectly successful election and the candidate who gets the most votes can win and so forth. Um, and then that candidate, that now president, and I suppose in our case, uh, would consolidate power, right? Would eliminate the checks and balances of the other branches, uh, would eliminate the independence of the civil service, uh, and would undermine the, uh, the independence authority of the judiciary. Um, and this is something that is a serious issue in the United States, in part because of the uh, the role the president plays anyway, right? The president is a very powerful role in the United States. It's a uh, way of presidential system. Um, but it's something that happened substantially more under the Trump administration. It's something that is widely expected to recur if Trump were to be even, you know, legitimately reelected. Um, so you'll remember some of these stories, uh, but Trump worked very hard to um, delegitimize and incapacitate different parts of our civil service, right? I, most obviously in the ju in the Justice Department, where where it, um, uh, investigations of criminal activity within the Trump administration, he attempted to sort of spike those, right? Uh, but it happened in a lot of other things too. So, for example, our health uh, administration uh, reports on COVID were um, altered. Uh, or at least they attempted to alter those uh, to make the numbers look better, I suppose, one way or another. Um, entire um, uh, bureaus were uprooted and moved to new states. And, you know, that's you know, we're about like two or three thousand miles away, which is, has the effect, obviously, since uh, people who work in government have uh, lives and families uh, of, you know, uh, basically eliminating all, uh, you know, senior people and men, most of the junior people too, and sort of complete, completing, uh, you know, allowing for basically a complete restaffing uh, of the agency. Um, looking forward, both the, the Trump campaign and the Heritage Foundation, which is a very central conservative think tank, pretty long standing here in the United States, have proposed, uh, you know, openly proposed policies uh, in a new Republican administration that would drastically reduce the independence of the civil service. So um, Trump uh, released right at the end, this was almost, it, almost completely unnoticed at the time because so many other things were happening at the same time, but right at the end of his administration, he released an executive order called Schedule F. Uh, which proposed to give him the authority to fire as many as 50,000 civil servants, right? So this would uh, very substantially undermine the independence of those of those institutions. And um, there's uh, the Heritage Foundation has released a document called Project 2025, which is intended for any Republican president going forward that um, that sort of consistently uh, aims to politicize uh, the civil service and also to undermine its independence. Okay. So given this this sort of uh, the direction of within the executive branch, um, what do we think the other branches can do? Unfortunately, uh, our Congress is um, pretty poorly positioned to put a serious check on executive authority, uh, in part because the level of dysfunction in Congress is so very high. Um, our various speaker fights may have made the news, I'm not sure, but we have, yeah, that's, that's that, yeah, um, which, uh, you know, there was a certain amount of, it reached a level of absurdity that was in some sense funny, but it was actually, of course, not funny, right, that our, we can't form sort of a governing coalition even within the Republican Party to run the United States House of Representatives, uh, and so that's an ongoing issue. Um, so the power of Congress has really eroded um, uh, in a, in a, for over a long period of time, and particularly at the moment, uh, where the parties now, even when they have majority control, have a very hard time getting their top priorities through. And you can see this on the Republican and on the Democratic side. So um, Democrats, for example, when they had a unified control, uh, their first piece of legislation they introduced was the For the For the People Act, which was a voting rights reform act, would have done a number of very good things to, pr to protect against some of the issues of uh, election manipulation that I mentioned. Uh, they couldn't get it done. Similarly, the Republican Party came into office uh, at um, at one point dead set on overturning Obamacare, which you may remember, the Affordable Care Act that um, expanded health insurance uh, under the Obama administration. Um, they came in dead set. I mean, it was the top campaign promise to overturn Obamacare. They, they couldn't, even with unified control, couldn't get it done. So there, there's really fundamental dysfunction and gridlock uh, in Congress that leaves the institution quite poorly positioned, I think, to act as a check. Uh, on the executive, even if they chose to do so, um, which in the case of unified party control would be, of course, less likely. Um, now, the legislature, on the other hand, our, our judiciary is quite powerful um, and has grown more powerful over time. So while we've seen Congress's authority decline in a lot of ways, uh, the Supreme Court's authority has increased, uh, you know, sort of a good marker of that was the 2000 case uh, Bush v. Gore, which determined the outcome of the presidential election. 
Previously, when we've had a contested outcome of the presidential election, it was the House of Representatives that made the decision. Uh, but in this case, it was decided by a lawsuit. So there was a real shift of authority there uh, that I think is pretty fundamental. Now, so the Supreme Court is quite powerful. So in that sense, they, they can act as a powerful check on the um, executive, though they don't have enforcement powers, right? Um, but the Supreme Court has grown substantially more partisan and, uh, and conservative in recent years. And this, again, is something that you can see very clearly just in straightforward political science data. The the skew of the court is, is quite far to the right at the moment, um, which has led many people to, in fact, most Americans doubt that Supreme Court decisions are made based on law. They think it's made based on politics now. Um, but uh, so the, the court is on the one hand quite uh, conservative uh, and quite uh, associated with the Republican Party. Of course, Trump uh, got to nominate an unusual number of Supreme Court justices. Uh, and then there, the other important fact to keep in mind is that the Supreme Court has substantially narrowed voting rights protections. So we, I talked about those major pieces of legislation in the 1960s that, uh, you know, the Voting Rights Act that um, expanded suffrage to, you know, to the, uh, you know, return voting rights to Black Americans. Um, there, Those laws have been whittled down. And I can talk a little bit more about specifically how that happened, which I think is really interesting. Um, but the Supreme Court has really narrowed uh, the scope of election protections that exist, uh, and I think has shown at least some interest in allowing uh, for a uh, reduction of civil service independence. And so there, there, are, I, I wouldn't, I don't think that the a, a reasonable observer would look at the Supreme Court as as though it were going to provide as strong of a protection as it as it sort of. Uh, it might if you just looked at the the strength uh, of the institution compared to to Congress. So uh, that's my quick review of democratic erosion in the United States. I'm happy to to take some questions.